Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Today I want to talk about prostate specific antigen or PSA. It's a protein that liquefies ejaculated semen allowing sperm cells to freely swim in order to facilitate conception. The majority of PSA ends up in the semen but a tiny amount of it enters the bloodstream. <clears throat> The PSA test measures the amount of PSA in the bloodstream, and most people think and have been told that it's a marker for cancer. Thus, PSA testing is recommended by most doctors and is represented as a means for detecting prostate cancer early, supposedly at its most treatable stage. Dr. Richard Ablin, friend of mine and a friend of the Wellness Forum here, is the researcher who discovered PSA, and he stated for many years that it's not a marker for cancer. And as the person who discovered PSA, I would think he would be a good person to consult about what it is good for and not good for. He says that a man with a PSA of 0.5 can have prostate cancer, while a man of PSA 11 could be cancer-free. It's a meaningless and unreliable number, a normal product of the prostate that is present in normal benign and cancerous prostates. Dr. Ablin says that the results of a PSA are slightly better, that the PSA test are slightly better than flipping a coin. Biopsy is the usual next step after a blood test shows elevated plasma PSA. The threshold for recommending biopsy is not based on evidence and was actually arbitrarily established. And this came to light in an FDA hearing um, the first time that PSA testing came in front of the FDA for approval. Dr. Paul Lang testified at the FDA hearing uh, that and acknowledged that um, factors other than cancer, including even prostate massage, could increase PSA levels and he could not defend the accuracy of the test. He also stated clearly that the diagnostic threshold of four as a trigger for biopsy was not based on research. When challenged, he got a little testy and he said, quote, we could have changed the data, we could have made it six, eight, ten, anything we wanted, okay? Well, it doesn't sound like four is a really firm number based on that statement. Lang also stated that no patients had been followed after PSA testing to see if doing so improved five-year survival. Well, in spite of this, the FDA approved the PSA test, but with limitations. The test was only to be used in monitoring men who had already been diagnosed with prostate cancer, not as a population screening test. The FDA is supposed to monitor the marketing activities of drug and device makers and claims that are made about drugs, devices, and procedures. But over the years, the agency has increasingly abdicated this responsibility, and I attribute this to the fact that the drug and device companies pay hundreds of millions of dollars in what they call user fees to the FDA every year. This practice has essentially turned the FDA into a business partner of the drug companies. So without any interference from the FDA, routine PSA testing was marketed as a screening test for healthy men, not a surveillance test for prostate cancer. And the reason is pretty easy to understand. If you're going to do some type, if you can do something that applies to all men over the age of 40 or 50, you've got a much bigger market than if you're only using this test for men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. It really just comes down to pure economics. Several years later, the FDA did go on ahead and approve the, FDA, the uh, PSA test for screening healthy men, but it had already been widely used illegally and off-label with no interference, as I mentioned before, from the FDA. So every year, millions of men are subjected to not only the PSA test, but also to biopsy if their routine blood test shows a PSA of four or higher. The biopsy is painful. It sometimes causes residual pain, blood in the urine and stool, infection, and even can be life-threatening. Antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections can result when the biopsy needle drags bacteria, bacteria from the bowel into the prostate and then back out again. The problem with biopsy results is that almost all men develop prostate cancer as they age, and almost all men die with prostate cancer, but not from it, and that's an important distinction. Thus, prostate cancer is often overdiagnosed the older a man is, and that means he is much more likely to be overdiagnosed. So, for example, um, my father has been recommended to have a PSA test, and um, he's 89 years old, so my sister and I don't allow him to have one because one thing that we both know is my father's 89, so he has prostate cancer. But the likelihood that it would be the thing that ends his life at this age is highly unlikely, and all we would do is turn my dad from a healthy person who is enjoying life to a worried person who has been told that he has prostate cancer and I don't think that's particularly productive for the way we want him to live his life. Um, 
Recommended treatments in response to the biopsy include prostatectomy, and right now over a million men in the United States have had a prostatectomy, a procedure that often results in incontinence and impotence. The net result of using PSA as a screening test for prostate cancer is the practice has added billions of dollars of expense to the healthcare system and the risk of harm outweighs the benefit. So to what extent does harm outweigh benefit? Well, healthcare policy specialist Peter Bach at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center analyzed the data on PSA testing and reported, quote, if a man has a PSA test today, and he uh, issued this statement in 2009, that leads to a biopsy and a diagnosis of prostate cancer that he is treated for, there is a 1 in 50 chance that by 2019 or later he will have been saved from a death from a cancer that would otherwise have killed him. And there is a 49 in 50 chance that he will have been treated unnecessarily for a cancer that was never a threat to his life. So that's significant. The data show that men have actually a 3% lifetime risk of dying of prostate cancer. This means that 97% of men who have a blood test showing elevated PSA are more likely to be harmed than benefit. Now the US Preventive Services Task Force has done extensive analysis which was recently updated to show what the risk benefit ratio actually is. So this is for men between 55 and 69 who are screened for a period of 10 to 15 years. And here it goes. If 1,000 men have a PSA test, 240 will have a positive result and 100 will have a positive biopsy which shows they have cancer. Between 20 and 59% of these cases will involve cancer that will not grow, spread, or kill the patient. Nonetheless, 80% of the 100 will choose treatment and 60 of them will have serious complications which include incontinence and impotence. All of this in order that three men out of the original 1,000 avoid metastatic disease and one to two men avoid death from prostate cancer. So if you wanted to quantify this benefit, it's a 0.001% to 0.002% uh, reduction in risk. It means that the risk of being harmed is at least 30 times higher than the chance of benefiting. 30 times higher. Authors of a new study, and that's what prompted me to do this, is I found this new study that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, these authors acknowledge that PSA testing is not a sound method for evaluating the risk of prostate cancer, and that there are many factors that can contribute to a higher PSA level, which is often the trigger for biopsy. And those factors include benign prostate, hy prostate hyperplasia, inflammation, travel, exercise, especially bike riding, urinary tract infections, and dietary supplements. The study was designed, and this is interesting, to determine if diet and lifestyle habits affect PSA levels in asymptomatic men with plasma levels of between 2 and 10. The study included 67 men who adopted lifestyle changes and 122 matched controls who didn't make any changes. The men in the intervention program were instructed to eliminate spicy foods, alcohol, and caffeine, and to discontinue bike riding for a minimum of eight weeks before having a repeat test. The men in the intervention group had a significantly lower PSA on the second test, 3.50 versus 5.09 in the control group. More men in the intervention group were able, able to avoid biopsy, 65.7% versus 7.4% in the control group, another significant uh, difference. Antti Renico, MD, commented that these results might explain why some men who choose active surveillance don't show evidence of prostate cancer while their PSA levels continue to increase. In other words, this doctor is really confirming what Dr. Adlin has said for years. PSA is not an accurate test. So here's my advice for men. The first thing is think before you agree to a PSA test. Look into this, get all the information, and make an informed decision. Now one of the problems is, unfortunately, PSA tests are routinely being um, uh, done as part of your annual visit to your doctor. I hear from men all the time via email and members who come in here and tell me they didn't even realize that they were being tested for this and then they get a call from the doctor's office who says you need to come in and talk to us because um, your PSA level is higher. So if you're told that you have PSA, remember that the test is unreliable, the threshold is arbitrary, and your risk of being harmed is significantly higher than the ch uh, chance of benefit. And also remember that you can lower your PSA and reduce your risk of prostate cancer significantly by adopting a whole foods, low fat, high fiber, plant-based diet, particularly giving up dairy. There is a considerable body of research that shows that the risk of a man consuming dairy products on a daily basis developing prostate cancer is actually higher than the risk that a smoker will develop lung cancer. So get the dairy products out of your diet, 
get, your, get to eating a healthy diet and a healthy, practicing healthy lifestyle habits, that's the best way to lower your risk. And if you're asymptomatic, I strongly recommend against a PSA test. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.